Thank you so much. <laughs>
Knights and knaves. Do you recall these puzzles? As a boy, I cherished one in particular. Two guards stand before two doors. One door leads to certain death, the other to freedom. Which is which, you do not know. One guard always tells the truth. The other always lies. Who is who, you do not know. You are allowed one and only one question to either of the guards, though not to both. Just one will answer you. Can you find the door that leads to freedom? In this world of truth and lies, in this house of mirrors, of actuality and reflection. Is there a way, a loophole perhaps, 
whereby the truth of the doors can be revealed. And what does this analogy mean for art, for music? Consequences beyond this simple example of Boolean algebra with its clear-cut solution. What does it mean for music when we speak of truth? In our world of lies, of deception, of contradiction, sleight of hand, cons, is there any possible path still towards an aesthetic truth? Dare we enter this house of mirrors to go through it, not skirt around it, to gaze forward directly at this conundrum, face to face, to understand something of the trickster-like nature of truth and falsehood. When composition asks these variant existential questions, there are no simple solutions, no clear-cut answers. But to shy away from such inquiries of no answers invites its own and perhaps deeper limitations when it comes to art. Therefore, I propose a music of speculation, a music of uncertainty. For years, I've called this characteristic of art bunte ungewissheit, iridescent uncertainty, borrowing a turn of phrase from that most musically committed philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Actual and virtual, true and false, live and recorded. The idea of doubling comes up often in music, perhaps most frequently in traditional notion, notions of orchestration. One thinks of cellos being doubled by the basses or the flutes doubling clarinets an octave higher, for instance. Perhaps there's a change of register or timbre in this doubling. In other words, the same, but slightly different. A doubling can also be thought of as a mirroring, a reflection, a replication with variation. Now, a good mirror maintains an honest resemblance, representation, of someone observing his or her own image. On the other hand, a distorting mirror plays with this assumption of fidelity, of honesty. We know that there are so-called slimming mirrors in department store dressing rooms, slenderizing us without diet, attributing that quality to the merchandise, not the mirror and thus coaxing us into a purchase. But funhouse mirrors at amusement parks take advantage of all sorts of intriguing distortions, fattening us, shrinking us, stretching us long, beheading us, multiplying our eyes, and by so doing, entertaining us with our grotesquely distorted representations. In these same parks, we also find the so-called house of mirrors, a place where perception can fool, where certainty is greeted with confusion, where spatial deception disorients our understanding of what is actual and what is illusory, resulting in our becoming entirely lost in a labyrinth of truth and falsehood. The technical apparatus of this piece sideshow was described beautifully by my dear friend Kai Johannes Polzhofer. He calls sideshow a machine for deception. Video exit number two entitled A Surgical Procedure.
Doubling. 
the same but slightly different. Let's push that conceptually just a bit further, just a bit skewed from what our traditional orchestration tells us. So now, the same but slightly perplexing. Again, a strange doubling. While eight musicians line up across the stage, all gazing at the audience, the octet is actually a doubled quartet. I'll leave a copy of the Blu-ray disc in the McGill Library for those who could not attend the recent fabulous performance of No High Banda and let you figure out who the doppelgangers are. Even if I didn't tell you about their presence, you would eventually apprehend it, if not explicitly, perhaps even subconsciously. However, there is another probably more apparent doubling going on, and that is the doubling that takes place between the live performed and the electronic recorded playback. Let me emphasize that, live performed and digitally recorded, the here and now in the flesh and the recorded past transmitted over loudspeakers. This is the doubling inherent in the electroacoustic mixed medium genre. It is, of course, nothing that I invented. It just so happens that I found myself at the opportune moment when analog audio recording became digital and what that might mean for a composer who uses sample databases of digitally recorded performance manipulated by now extremely fast computer algorithms. This seems mundane, but let's take a closer look. If you will allow me then an extended metaphor with some playful thinking. If live music is music performed by live musicians, here and now, in the flesh, then recorded music, logically, might well be called dead music, live and dead, themselves doubled realms. So in this house of mirrors with its many doublings, the living and the dead are allowed to mingle. With these extremely fast algorithms applied to these recorded samples, the dead might become extraordinarily facile, might be able to mimic the live, even surpass them. And who is who becomes at times nearly impossible to ascertain. In fact, during rehearsals, neighboring musicians would swear that a sound on the pre-recorded playback was being reproduced by someone in the room. So, even the musicians themselves are tossed in this machine for deception, not only the observing audience. And in fact, one day, the saxophonist during a certain production, Philipp Steudlin, asked a very good question. As there are many moments where one is directed to lip sync sounds on the playback. He queried, I'm told to lip sync here, but there's nothing on the playback to lip sync to. I think my best answer was to concede that this strangeness too was a possibility in this metaphorical house of mirrors. In any case, I've st stated elsewhere that the theater in Sideshow is itself an orchestration, one that has projected, amplified itself to such a degree that it is now made not only emphatically audible, but visible. And I tend, with some exceptions, to amplify the already visible artifacts of music performance, cueing, that is, looking at each other for coordination, 
page turns, tapping one's foot to keep time, etc. So what musicians do in any case, and gestures they would understand and be good at, were they to become explicit and thus theatrical. And so the theatrical is derived not from theater, but rather from music. And that is very interesting as it showcases musical existence. Okay, all this is intriguing at best, but I believe the most striking doubling that arises in Sideshow is a doubling that takes place nearly subconsciously at first, but grows over the length of the piece. This is the doubling between the staged musicians and the audience. Again, who is who? Who is observer? Who is observed? However, just a note on this, which takes us to the historical component of Sideshow, that also has a doubling of sorts. The doubled gaze. In his short prose piece entitled The Flypaper, Das Fliegenpapier, written between the two world wars, the Austrian author Robert Musel describes the inspection of an observer peering through a magnifying glass, watching a fly die on flypaper. On the side of the insect's abdomen are the spiracles, little breathing holes, one that he notes ceaselessly opens and shuts like a small human eye. This doubling, the gazing at and then the gazing back, is the mirroring of the scientific objective gaze, one that Musel depicts as hardly objective, rather voyeuristic even sadistic. And we know this winking fly has its revenge for what is done unto it. Death by the paper's poisonous vapors will in turn be unleashed onto us humans on the battleground in the gas chambers. Likewise, for an audience member who has innocently come to watch a show, to have the tables turned around and the so-called fourth wall broken down, there is the possibility to create a rather disturbing, uneasy relationship between the two sides of the mirror stage when the roles of observer and observed can be exchanged. Sideshow attempts to address, create this discomfort, though implicitly, subtly, subcutaneously, if you will. And so the very relationship of performer and audience is by necessity the larger target of this mirror doubling metaphor. It is nearly inescapable for the staged musicians to avoid a staring contest with the seated audience members. I only instruct the performers that if this, if this becomes the case, they must win at all cost. Video excerpt number three, entitled Electrocuting an Elephant.
Lastly, there is the historical doubling that I promised, a mirror that maps our early century onto that of the last century, specifically to the heyday of the amusement parks at Coney Island, New York. I'm not saying that history repeats itself, not exactly, but there are strange resemblances. The themes, the events, even the grinning in Sideshow mirror those of the Grand Park's early successful and unsuccessful institutions of entertainment that are foundational to our current day enterprise. A very early film of Thomas Edison documented the electrocution of Topsy, an elephant in Coney Island whose cruel public execution by the AC electricity of Edison's competitor, Tesla, was utilized to promote the former's own DC product in 1903. The first fully industrialized world war was nearly on the horizon. Freud's theories of the psyche and dreams of 1899 were now popular. In fact, Freud visited Coney Island's Dreamland Park, and there is even a photograph that claims to be him visiting and perhaps evaluating the metaphor in the eyes and hands of Americans in accordance with his theories on dreams. Karl Krauss's aphorisms provide still another reflection on the same though indexing the European crisis of culture from a brutally caustic polemicist's perspective. And I suppose I must confess that really the underlying and all-encompassing doubling that I'm most interested in, the doubling of the internal and external worlds the disturbed creative psyche with its vast, endless realm of the imagination, repressed and overloaded with its fears, terror, doubts, and hopes, doubled against the commercial world of exploitative entertainment in capitalist economies that we find ourselves in, new music, capitalized new music, neue Musik, also unable to escape the charges and accusations or at least suspicions of complicity that we can more easily direct at, say, our friendly circus sideshows, the popular amusement parks the world over, Hollywood movies, or what has become reality television and its infusion into politics in our own time, in our own century. As I like to say, the best criticism is self-criticism. Some have asked me if there is any vestige or remnant of hope inside show. Some have offered their understanding of where hope might hide itself somewhere in this piece, conceal itself in the shadow of its ruse. I like the oft-quoted witticism of Kafka when he says, hope? There's an infinite amount of hope in the universe just not for us. Ah, again, that delicious sleight of hand. Now you see it, now you don't. But I say, especially having said so much about eyes and eyes and more eyes just now, well then, keep looking. So by now, I'm sure some of you have worked out the puzzle of the two guards. The one always lying, the other always truthful. 
Yes, indeed. One asks either of the guards, Gallant sir, tell me what your fellow comrade here would say, which is the door to freedom. The guard that always tells the truth points truthfully to the door that his lying partner would point to, which is a lie, and so the door that leads to death. We choose the other door, which leads to freedom. The guard who lies contemplates which door his truthful partner would point to, the door that leads to freedom, but as he always lies, he then points to the door that leads to death. We choose the other door, which leads to freedom. Isn't it curious that whether we are given the truth or a lie, the same door is pointed to? And isn't it also curious that it is the opposite door that we must choose? Moreover, you will never know if the guard who responds to you is the lying or truthful one. Yet despite this, you will find the door to freedom. This is the logic of the house of mirrors. But again, what, what does this mean for music? And here we get to the crux of the matter. Thank you for your patience. What does this rotation provide us with in the end? I mentioned a loophole. Sideshow as a house of beers, as a machine for deception, is a conceptual architecture by which the expressive in music might be rescued. Was it lost? Was it neglected? Was it abandoned? Whatever the case, and we might call this case the 20th century, it would be difficult, a difficult task, perhaps naive at best, to claim one could approach better gaze directly, unmediatedly at the expressive with all its yearning, grieving, mourning, desperate struggle. Too much pathos, the post-music composer might protest. Perhaps they'd be right. Better like Perseus, use a mirror to look into the Gorgon's eyes. The mirror provides a solid, reliable, can we say sometimes indifferent frame. It not only reflects, but deflects. The mirror still projects an illusion, the mirror of illusions to stare directly into the Gorgon's eyes is to gaze uncompromisingly at the meaninglessness of existence, to scan the horizon from one darkness to another and become petrified in its nihility like a stone statue, immobile, frozen, as in a straitjacket, or preserved like a specimen in a jar of formaldehyde, its decomposition arrested, no, forbidden. Music theater in an ice cube. Excerpt number four, Morning Glory.
Thank you very much for listening.